I think this is the least amount of clothes I've ever worn on camera. <laughs> Hi, I'm Peter, and this is Go Verb and Noun. Emily Eifler is awesome. So I interviewed her. I won't tell you too much about her because she does an awesome job of that herself. However, it bears noting that there are some fairly big names in the YouTube education scene that follow her. That isn't to say that she's simply famous by proxy. In fact, her subscriber count weighs in at just around 5,500 people. So now, without further ado, let's get back to the show. My name's Emily, and I make Blink Pop Shift, which is a art and... What is my channel? Like technology. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. I make a culture and technology show called Blink Pop Shift, and it's fun. So there's a channel called The Idea Channel, which is made by PBS um, and Mike Rugnetta. And I can't remember how I found them, but I was watching that show and I realized like, oh, that's just cultural criticism. I can do that. <laughs> I was never interested in vlogging, not that because my life is like tragically uninteresting or anything, but because I felt like in the future, vlogging is going to be like a record of the commons and like that's really valuable, but that wasn't the thing that I wanted to be on record for in 500 years um, when some anthropologist is like going through YouTube. Like I wanted to make videos that had a purpose, so I decided educational and I'm really into technology and so I was just like, well, fuck it, let's just do this. Am I not supposed to cuss? I don't care. Okay. <laughs> I didn't realize until just then. <laughs> like, this is not broadcast television, it's fine. Yeah. The channel, like, got me my current job, and I've met tons of really amazing people, and all these things that I didn't, that I really wanted to do, I didn't know were possible, and I, you know, like, just making the channel, like, gave me an avenue to be smart and, like, write and stuff without feeling like I was being arrogant or showy or like and anyways like the stuff I write about like I wrote for a good example is that I wrote my thesis about the differences and similarities and like sort of cultural nuances of um, the map versus the territory and especially like in digital spaces so like digital maps of physical worlds and like Google Maps and stuff like that and and how we understand the physical world through this digital map but the way that it came out, like, I feel like that idea is really interesting, but it came out in this thesis. Like, that was what you ended up with. And I feel like five people read it, and then it was nothing. And I spent a year writing it. So I ended up being like, I just can't, I can't fathom spending a year writing one thing that five people are going to read. And even if only ten people see it, at least when you make a video, you can get lots of ideas out there. You don't have to be known for like just the girl who wrote the thing about maps and territories. Like you get to be more diverse. For sure, for sure. They are very separate people. This is a purposeful thing. Oh yeah. I'm very weird and awkward and like shy around people I don't know. So there's a lot of like there's a lot of stuff about normal Emily that just doesn't work on camera. And I'm not a performer per se, but like the content and the writing is more important to me than like my natural personality. And because it's not about my life, I'm more interested in the writer of the of the um, script being the person on being the person filmed as opposed to me. And because much like in an article that I would publish, like it's edited and like we consider it, and there's like research and you like do the so it's a very considered like piece of writing. It's not just like your journal. So the person in the videos is this like considered edited person and not the journal of me, not the natural form. And anyways, it's just more interesting to me to see like a hyperized form of myself, this hyperized character that I play on the videos and she's more articulate and she's, she, because she gets to get cut into this very like succinct form, she gets a lot more power and energy than I would have in normal life. Like that's any, how anyone would be in editing. And I also really like that she's different than my natural self because I think a lot of people don't realize this when watching the show, but I mean, I'm an artist and part of the show is not just like a presentational thing about technology. People constantly complain about my editing style, editing style, editing style, because they think that, oh, my goal is to get across a clear, concise argument about this topic. That's not the goal. The goal is to talk about technology and culture 
inside of technology and culture in a way that makes you that makes you see the veil. Like the whole style of the show is built to make you see the veil. And so the character of me is a veil, the editing is a veil, the way it's written, all the like stuff that I put in it, all that stuff, the music, everything is constructed to make you see the interface of the video as not a natural thing because it's not. And the, the idea that like you can be natural on camera, which is something that a lot of people's goal is, is to like, oh, well, just be natural. People always say that. It's like, you don't want to be natural. I, I don't want to be just me, whatever, do, like just talking to you. I want to be a stylized figure that represents something stylistically inside of the videos. Yeah, it's fake. Yeah. And that, that's the point. And that it's frustrating to me when people focus in on the editing, but they don't, they're, I'm like, okay, that's the goal. I want you to focus on the editing, but now take the next step and be like, okay, well, why? Like, why would someone do that? Because it's obviously an impedance to your experience of a natural flow. So like, why? That's all I want. And it's obvious that a lot of people aren't, just aren't doing that. And I'm not willing to like hand walk them through doing it. But there are a lot of people that I have noticed that really understand that intuitively right at the beginning, which I, and those are the people that I want watching my videos. <laughs> I want you to be aware, yeah. Like, I want you to be aware that you're watching it on a flat screen and you're sitting on a couch and you're watching it on a laptop. Like, I don't want you to be absorbed into the frame of the video. Do you know the term Brechtian? Um, Brechtian is this term in theater. Um, this guy who decided that, like, the beautifications of theater is, like, all of the curtains and all of this, all of this stuff and the, the stage sets and the costumes and other stuff, that actually draws away from the story. And when said what he wanted to do was just like strip all that away and be like, you are sitting in a theater watching a play. Like that that little part was important to the cognition of the thing that you were watching. He was one of, that was one of my favorite things to study when I was in college was sort of like Brechtian ideas of, of theater and performance, that it's not a fairy tale land, that, that it's, that you need to be aware of the thing itself and the thing inside of the thing. The sort of onion skin of performance and all that kind of stuff. So. I read a lot of blog posts and books and articles just on like everything that's currently happening. All the news and what people are arguing about, all this stuff. Uh, I love Wired, and but Wired is sort of a... Um, a vanillaized version of a lot of the arguments that are going on in tech, but you know, it's like a fun thing to read. And I especially re re like to read a lot of like technology theorists, like um, Kevin Kelly is probably like my favorite. He wrote this book called What Technology Wants, and it is my Bible. I love it so much. Um, <laughs> but so I just read a lot and I listen to tons of podcasts and all this stuff, and I start to um, sort of gather little pieces like, oh, something just recently won a Turing test. So I was like, oh, okay, well, what can that possibly mean? So I get that little nugget and then I'll get another nugget about cyber war and I'll get, I'll get a couple of things going and like, I'll think that they're all going to be separate videos. And then eventually I'll be like, oh, actually these 10 things are all connected by this one thing. So then you like string them all together, like beads on a string or whatever. And then you're like, all right, now I have all this shit and I have to figure out like how to mash it together into one script. Then you go into like research mode where I'm just like looking up everything I possibly can about all these diff these like several topics and like trying to puzzle piece them together in a way that people will understand. I usually realize that there's like a revelation in there somewhere that I haven't found yet. And I always find that in the research mode. And you just come across like a sentence or two at like the bottom of somebody's like scholarly article and you're like, oh shit, God damn it. That'll connect over here and then this and then that. And then suddenly you're like, you have all this web and then you just like mush it into a script. And my scripts end up being like way too long. And then I edit them and then I print them out and I cut them up with scissors and I tape them back together. I like tape and scissors, it's very funny. <laughs> and then I like highlight it and all this stuff. Um, and then so once the script is done, I usually hate it for like a day. And then the next day I'm like, well, even if I hate it, you still have to, you still have to shoot it. So then I shoot and shooting usually takes around an hour, sometimes it can take longer than that, um, but my videos aren't terribly long, so a thousand word script is usually about an hour's worth of shooting, because I fuck it up a lot. And I, this goes back to the natural thing, I don't do long takes. I try to do one to two sentence takes, because 
I try to cut as much air out as possible. So I'm going to cut like in between words anyway. So I'll, I don't see the point in like trying to take really long takes because I'm going to cut them anyway. Even if I get a five sentence take that's perfect, I'm going to chop it into like 15 pieces. Basic editing in Premiere. My favorite thing about editing is like, I'll get it like pretty smooth and like I'll get the like rhythm working pretty well. And then, you know, like once I get it like smooth and it's like too good, I'll start to like fuck with it. Like I'll move a chunk like way forward in the video or I'll start to like mess with the pattern. And I actually got that from a Zay Frank video where he talks about like, he's talking through like a coffee shop scene or something. He's talking about like being really specific. And but he, he mentioned something in there about like, you notice yourself getting into a cadence and that cadence can like lull people so as soon as I notice a cadence I start to like that's when I start to mess with the speed and everything because it like jolts you into being like oh right this isn't like a natural there's a speed bump so I try to enter lots of speed bumps and all that stuff and then I publish it and then I just totally forget that it exists <laughs> and I never watch it again that's awesome. that's really cool. and then like two weeks later I go back and look at the comments <laughs> Actually, that's not even true. Sometimes I never look at the comments and Steve will go back and look at the comments and be like, this person said this and this is terrible. And it's actually kind of fun to just like experience the comments like through him. <laughs> when you're making a movie, you want people to slide into that sort of middle space between the movie theater and the screen where they're not aware of like the guy sneezing five rows behind them. Even if they hear it, they're like still on screen with Iron Man. That's not really what I'm interested in doing. Yeah, and absorption doesn't really seem like what my goal really is, so. It's so much better than I thought it was gonna be. One, everyone starts out totally shitty. I cannot watch my original videos because it is uncomfortable because I am like talking so slow and I'm so shy and I have no idea what I'm doing and it's the lighting is terrible everything's terrible and I was shooting on my iPhone because I had I had no other camera I've, I, I shot on my iPhone for eight months for almost the entire last year I shot on my phone <laughs> it wasn't until a friend of mine was like we should probably like not do that <laughs> you, sh you could use like a real camera <laughs> it's also been a uh, confidence building exercise that I didn't expect. I've always been a writer, but I'm not terribly social. And I had spent the two or actually the three years before that um, in grad school with people who I think liked me, but they liked me, but I was very separate from them. And sort of like what I thought about was what I thought was interesting and what um, I was researching and all this stuff was very separate from what everyone else was doing. And I was... I wasn't like socially accepted as part of the group and I was, you know, I was called like the Borg, things like that, <laughs> which at the time I just accepted as like a social moniker. But uh, the more I think about it, it was just like an excuse to keep me socially separate from everyone else because people didn't understand or, or whatever or something about me. But being on YouTube has helped me realize like, oh, when, when I don't fit in, like, that's not just me. It's not just uh, that I am shitty at fitting in. It's also like, you fit in when the group works and that when you work as a unit as part of the group. And I, it was, this is part of the first year of my life when I felt like that I had really found a way to do that. I had found the right friends and people who uh, were interested in the same things I was interested in and that kind of thing. So it took me a while to get there. <laughs> and it's also just been much more accepted than I ever expected. Like I don't have millions of subscribers, but like my 10 favorite YouTubers all watch my channel which is like mind boggling to me. <laughs> like if you want success on YouTube, don't define it as millions of subscribers. Describe, define it as like the people that you like, like what you make. Cause that's just the best. Yeah. I feel like my ideas are appreciated by the people who I would like to appreciate them. And they also makes me feel great that I don't have to work really hard to build a huge audience. Yeah. I feel like Trying to build an audience is the wrong thing to do for me. If, if you want YouTube to be a job or to be that kind of successful, then, then those are really things that you need to think about. But I don't need it to be that. So I can consider other questions about what the channel can be or what I want it to do, stuff like that. And I by no means would ever want YouTube to be like my one and only thing. 
like I really like my current situation because I get to make technology and then I also get to like share my passion and like share that those things with other people and I don't have to put pressure on the channel to perform in a way that it isn't it doesn't really need to the channel can be an outlet and like uh, something interesting to do but it doesn't need to be like the thing that pays for my mortgage or whatever What's weird to me is I don't feel like YouTube is facilitating that. I feel like Tumblr is facilitating that. Like, this is true. This is I feel true. like YouTube hosts the videos and then Tumblr and Twitter do all of the work, like, of actually connecting people. Because those gifts that I made for Art Assignment, they only found and were only published on Tumblr. So, <laughs> and it's it, that is a great segue into like, um, like comments on YouTube are what YouTube sees as like its community building aspect, but comments to me at least feel like that's not actually something that's meant for a person to talk to me that's meant for a person to come not from an embedded video but actually onto youtube's page so that youtube can get an advertising click so comments to me aren't like about me at all comments are about youtube getting people to be physically on youtube and not an embedded player do drugs kids <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. I hope I didn't mash the microphone too much. Yeah.